All right, in chapter 25, we are finally going to talk about diagnostic clinical microbiology, which is something that I think is really cool because it ties together all of the concepts we've been talking about into ways that we can identify microbes, grow microbes, things like this. So it's using all the concepts we've talked about to actually do things to make sure that we identify what microbes people have and then ultimately uh, give them something to help them with those. So I think this is a really important chapter. Uh, we can't cover everything. So if you're really interested in this, this is a great one to go to the textbook and read. This is an awesome chapter um, of applying all this information. We're gonna talk first about specimen collection. Um, I'm not going to tell you exactly how to do everything. Uh, obviously, I'm not an expert in specimen collection, but there are some key things that need to be thought about when specimens are collected. Um, we'll talk about uh, some technologies used to process this stuff and identify what might be in there. Um, and particularly, I want to talk about what we call point of care detection methods. Um, these are often rapid tests and things like this. And then we'll talk a little bit about um, what we call algorithms, which are um, standard procedures to identify clinical specimens. Okay, so this is probably uh, the most important case study for us. We have Jean. She's 63 years old, um, and she's taken to a hospital. Um, she was disoriented, non-responsive. Um, so her husband says that she's normally quite active, uh, which is important to know with elderly, right? What is their normal uh, state? But over the past 25 hours, she became tired and then couldn't even answer simple questions. So uh, they suspect something like a stroke given her age. So there's no obvious signs of stroke though. No headache or uh, the unilateral muscle weakness, a weakness on one side of the body that generally is associated with the stroke. So they uh, start doing other tests, take blood. Um, and because she's so unresponsive, she can't walk to go to the bathroom, they put in a catheter to collect urine. So they're gonna do white blood cell counts. Um, those actually look rather normal, but here's the critical part. The nurse that is attending to her notices that the urine in her collection bag is cloudy. That's a key thing that somebody needs to notice here. And uh, that insight will actually save this person's life. So the urine bag, uh, not great to test because it's been sitting there for a while. So they obtain a fresh specimen and there are uh, specialized urine test strips that can be used. Um, these are called rapid dipstick tests and they reveal different things uh, both about the patient but also what's going on in the patient's body. Uh, in this case, levels of nitrites which indicate bacterial growth as well as um, uh, some enzymes from leukocytes, white blood cells, uh, signify that there is a urinary tract infection going on here. You might not know this, but urinary tract infections can actually be very severe, especially in the elderly. When they take her urine sample, they're gonna do that dilution series and they'll find that there's over 100,000 bacteria per milliliter. So that's one, two, three, four, five, ten 10 to the fifth bacteria in there. That's a lot of bacteria in someone's urine. They grow these on a selective plate, McConkie agar, and they find that it's gram negative rod that will ferment lactose. So it looks like this is E. coli, um, most likely. Uh, which is a common cause of UTIs. Um, on the third day, we finally get all of the metabolic tests done and we do confirm that it's E. coli. But at this point, um, we've given her antibiotics for this and released her. So uh, in this case, um, the antibiotics, she recovers uh, within hours. Uh, this is the fascinating thing and the magical thing about antibiotics is that they work very, very rapidly. Um, so in, within 24 hours, she's back to normal and out of the hospital walking under her own power. So a lot of older patients don't recognize the symptoms of UTIs. And um, because of that, the toxins that the bacteria produce can build up and then spread into the bloodstream. Uh, this case could have quickly led to death um, but, right, the keen observation of this nurse 
identified that problem. So understanding not just what to do, but also what to look for and what might be causing that is key for all people that are working with patients, um, but not just people that are working with patients, everyday life, right? Um, her husband probably had no idea what was going on. They thought it might be a stroke, um, but this possibility and understanding that urinary tract infections can happen, and if they're not treated, can become quite severe, is, I think, key for everyone to understand. So that, I think, hopefully brings home everything we've been trying to do in this course. Um, we're going to talk about some of the processes involved in 25.1 of this, right? Collecting specimens is our first bit. And uh, we're mainly going to talk about taking specimens from different body sites. So there are locations in our body that we consider sterile. Um, they should have no bacteria growing there. And then there are sites that are non-sterile. They have large amounts of bacteria. Usually these are healthy bacteria from our microbiome in there. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, what is required to collect from these sites um, and how we can kind of eliminate the normal microbiota in non-sterile sites out of uh, these collections. So first, right, we've talked a lot about treatments, um, but we've also talked a lot about identifying microbes. And um, it is very important as you're probably aware, to identify the most likely suspects, right? Um, we have to figure out what is causing an infection to treat it properly. And as we've seen, uh, we sus can suspect one thing, but uh, it may be completely different. So we could suspect bacteria, but it could be viral in nature. That's gonna require very different treatments. So we start with the signs and symptoms, right? Knowing what uh, can most often cause these is key to rapidly responding to those signs and symptoms. The, the, sometimes the very early things that you do can really determine whether uh, someone has a good outcome or a bad outcome. Also taking into consideration what is going on in the community. Being aware of public health is critical, right? Um, are there currently outbreaks of certain diseases? Uh, in the past few years, we have seen uh, whooping cough, RSV, um, many things, particularly after the pandemic when we stopped social distancing, uh, we've seen large outbreaks of other diseases that were lower during the pandemic. Um, and then we need to know what biochemical, molecular, serological, or antigen detection strategies we can use to rule out or uh, isolate whatever we think is growing there. Why do we need to do this? Well, as we know, many bacteria are resistant to certain antibiotics. Gram positives, gram negatives respond differently to different antibiotics. Um, so we usually will try to narrow it down to a best guess, and then we start that fast empirical therapy. Where we just start giving them antibiotics. We're not 100% sure what it is, but we start something, okay? But if that doesn't work, we need to know what to switch to. Also, tracking global patterns, particularly of antibiotic-resistant pathogens, is key. Before 1970, most Neisseria gonorrhea isolates, so this is the bacteria that causes the sexually transmitted infection, gonorrhea, most of them were susceptible to penicillin. Since then, in modern day, most gonorrhea isolates are actually resistant. So knowing that that change has occurred um, and being aware of the current state of the field is key, right? A doctor who um, was treating this in the 1970s would have prescribed penicillin. Uh, they need to stay up on what is going on, right? Um, so I think that's one important thing uh, there, knowing the global uh, distribution of things. Specific pathogens um, often are associated with secondary disease complications. We call these sequelae. Um, something like rheumatic fever, you have streptococcus um, infection, and uh, that can leave toxins behind. So even when the infection clears up, that can lead to damage to the heart, which we call rheumatic fever. Um, so this often happens when children have strep throat. Um, they'll have a sore throat, but we need to be watchful later for the symptoms of rheumatic fever, which can damage the heart. We have to also identify what the microbe is 
to track the spread, right? We want to know where this came from, particularly when there's outbreaks of disease. So knowing what type of microbe it is can limit the possible um, uh, sources of it. So um, all of these things are reasons why it's important to identify what the infectious agent actually is. And here's an example, right? We have a case where we have eight infants who all come into the hospital with bloody diarrhea. Um, as we know, diarrhea can be very dangerous for infants because they have such low body mass uh, that loss of water can quickly dehydrate them. The lab clinically identifies that these are the same strain of Shigella sonii. So they're identical strains, which leads us to believe that there might be a common source of this pathogen, right? Uh, if we had eight infants come in and they all had different causes of this bloody diarrhea, that would be weird. But when they all have uh, the same strain of the same species, uh, that suggests some common link. So public health workers would talk to these people and they'd ask the parents uh, where they go, what they do. And we find in this case that all eight go to the same daycare center. Because of that information, because we identified that the microbe was the same, we can then go to that daycare center and figure out what might be causing this outbreak and that can prevent future spread, right? So other kids don't have to get sick because we identified this microbe. To do this identification, we usually need to isolate um, and collect specimens from patients. Um, to do this, uh, we have to use different techniques depending on what we suspect and um, what area of the body is infected. Um, so we could take things like blood. Um, we could take uh, tissue scrapings if we suspect a skin infection, um, urine samples, stool samples. Um, we can use different apparatuses. Uh, often the cotton swab is very useful. So let's look at one case where we need to take a, uh, a sample. So we have a four-year-old boy. He goes to the hospital and he's being evaluated because he has persistent rectal pain. Uh, it began about a week earlier, so he had just kind of general pain in the region, and um, they take a blood sample, and they, and they find that his white blood cell count is elevated. Um, they then go on, they don't see anything externally, so they do an abdominal CT scan, and this reveals an abscess. So an abscess is a walled off region uh, that contains infectious bacteria, and it's right next to his rectum. So this is what's causing the pain. Obviously, we couldn't see that from the outside. So with this, they take a needle and they actually puncture the abscess and drain it, and they drain 20 milliliters of yellowish uh, fluid out of that and it stinks it's nasty 20 milliliters is quite a lot of fluid to come out of a little child's body uh, they're going to take this specimen and plate it on blood agar and they plate it under aerobic conditions but they don't find any evidence of bacteria nothing grows on that plate despite this nasty material that's in there clearly there's an infection why didn't anything grow on the plate. Hopefully you can see where this is going. Well, there's a problem in their technique of collecting and processing the sample here. So abscesses that tend to be near the gastrointestinal tract generally contain anaerobic bacteria. So in this case is Bacteroides fragilis. Um, this can commonly escape the intestines and cause these abscesses. So when they collected it, they probably um, just spread it on a plate using a swab or some sort of spreader, and then they grew it in an oxygen a rich environment. This really should have been collected under anaerobic conditions, marked as being uh, needed to be processed under anaerobic conditions as well. So there's some breakdown in communication there. Um, because it was under aerobic, nothing grew. So there are specialized systems for collecting anaerobic samples, um, like this special tube. It has a rubber stopper and gasket in it. So you take out the swab, 
collect your sample and then put it back in and then shake this up, which breaks this little capsule down here um, that removes the oxygen from this container. And then that needs to be marked that it needs to be processed uh, anaerobically. In most cases, we can group specimens from human bodies into two broad categories. We can collect things from areas that are normally sterile or from areas that normally have microbiota, so aren't sterile. Each needs to be collected differently and processed differently. There are a few sites in the human body that are considered sterile. Uh, we have blood, cerebrospinal fluid, Plural fluid, this is the tissue uh, that lines the lungs and the chest. Synovial fluid uh, between the joints. A peritoneal fluid, which covers abdominal organs. And any tissue from uh, most of our internal organs should be sterile. Um, because of this, any microbes you find in a sample from those locations are considered significant, right? If you can grow any microbes from these regions, there are... Uh, those are probably causal of the infection that we're seeing. So we don't need to process these in any super special way on like selective media, right? Although you could do that, um, any microbes you find are considered significant. Uh, just to note some changes maybe from uh, what's previously been taught, um, the bladder and the lungs have for a long time thought to be sterile. Um, they are now known to contain some microorganisms uh, as natural microbiota. These tend to be anaerobic um, things or they're difficult to grow, so we weren't able to detect them. But there are some microbes that inhabit the bladder and the lungs. Um, so they're not completely sterile uh, tissues or locations. So when we take something like a blood culture, um, this can actually be used and put into a whole automated system. So we collect through vein puncture um, and uh, we can put them into special bottles that actually have sensors that can detect, that can detect things like CO2 from the growth of bacteria. Um, or we have special fluorescent dyes in there, um, things like agar plates, as we've talked. When you collect a blood sample though, you have to go through the skin. That's problematic because if you notice, the skin was not one of our sterile sites. So oftentimes you're also getting a little bit of skin bacteria that comes with it. So you do try to clean the site beforehand. Uh, that's both to prevent bacteria from going into the blood from the skin, but also collecting bacteria from the skin. But sometimes if you need uh, to do this, you can collect from two different sites to try to rule out skin contaminating microbes. Blood needs to be grown under both aerobic and anaerobic conditions um, because we're looking for uh, both types of microbes that are possible in there. Cerebrospinal fluid, we've talked a lot about this one uh, with meningitis. This can be collected by a lumbar puncture, which is a, a, called a spinal tap. Um, and then you can actually centrifuge this material to collect any cells that might be in there um, and then do the gram stain on them. Uh, if white blood cells or bacteria are found, that's very serious, right? That is a meningitis infection. And we can detect that quite rapidly through microscopy and also through culture. If you suspect a certain type of bacteria, PCR tests can rapidly be done. Plural, synovial, peritoneal fluids, all collected through needle aspiration. Um, and you can take those and, again, do microscopy. If you find any um, PMNs or macrophages in there, uh, that's an indication that there is an infection occurring. And we can have both aerobic and anaerobic um, microbes in here. So they need to be cultured in both ways. All right, so now to the non-sterile sites or what we would call sites in the body with normal microbiota. This presents a problem because if we go to culture them, we're gonna find all kinds of bacteria. And as we know, our microbiome, not all bacteria in our body are bad. So how do we separate the good bacteria from the ones that are causing the infection? 
Well, in this case, we're going to need to use selective media to decrease the number of normal microbes that we find and try to sort out the pathogenic ones. So selective media is a must for non-sterile sites. Uh, sites with normal microbiota, like I said, the skin, any sort of abscesses, um, throat, nasopharyngeal samples, all of these places are going to have normal microbiota. Um, when we look at the skin, um, we can often take scrapings looking for viral or fungal infections. Um, so you can just scrape with a sterile um, scalpel. Um, deep wound abscesses, um, usually needle aspiration, and this should be suspected to be anaerobic a lot of times. Um, if the abscess is draining, uh, like it's open, um, you can collect that with a swab. You still might consider both aerobic and anaerobic, obviously, um, but uh, nasopharyngeal, uh, we're all too familiar with this swabbing uh, deep into the nose, uh, and um, this is collected with swabs, viruses, bacteria often infect this region. You can see here a tonsil swab uh, is being used. So uh, all of these can um, be uh, non-sterile sites. We also have specimens from the lungs, uh, particularly the deep lungs. Um, because we do have some uh, natural microbes in the lungs, uh, we need to plate these on selective media. But collecting them can be risky because a lot of times lung infections are transmitted through respiratory droplets. So to get that tissue, you often need to collect sputum. And sputum is the deep lung secretions, um, and it results from inflammation. So it's the nasty, thick, goopy stuff. It's not saliva, right? It's not spit. It is the phlegm and stuff that actually comes from the lungs. Um, there are special, basically, chambers where we can put people that we suspect of having respiratory infections to collect the sputum samples. So they're not sitting there <laughs> hawking up stuff out in uh, general public, right? Especially if we suspect like pneumonia or TB. So you can actually have uh, sputum collection chambers here. In some cases, um, we can induce sputum uh, production kind of by inhaling a uh, warm salt water vapor. Um, other patients might have trouble producing sputum or getting it up. Um, so in those cases, we often have to do the bronchioalveolar lavage, where uh, you actually go down with a tube and suck out material. Um, it uses sterile liquid to flush out the material, and then you suction it up. And that can be used particularly um, on young patients. You have to do that because um, if, if they're not really comprehending what's going on, they have trouble uh, following your directions. The lungs have a small number of natural microbes associated with them. All right, now on to the not fun ones. Um, stool samples. Um, this can be collected in several ways. Uh, we have the rectal swab here um, or the cup method. So you can get it while it's coming out or you can go in to go get it. I think obviously here with stool samples, you have to use selective media. You have to reduce the number of normal bacteria uh, that are in there to try and isolate the ones that are causing any sort of infection. Urine collection, again, I mentioned this was previously thought to be sterile, but uh, there are some anaerobes that are in there, not easily culturable, um, so we didn't detect them for a long time. But we often have to uh, take urine samples to detect UTIs that are occurring. Um, oftentimes UTIs are aerobic microbes. Um, so there's two ways um, to collect this, right? You can uh, do the, what we call midstream clean catch. So catch it as it's coming out. Unfortunately, sometimes it can contact the skin in these cases. So that can contaminate this. Um, Using a catheter can ensure full aseptic collection, but catheters have their own problems because they can theoretically introduce bacteria from the urethra into the bladder. So if the infection is in the urethra, 
and you stick a catheter in, it can actually transport those microbes up to the bladder, which can be a more serious infection. So um, UTIs suck. Like uh, there's so many bacteria surrounding the entrance there that oftentimes uh, it's difficult to not contaminate people when this is happening. Um, like we saw in the uh, case study at the beginning, uh, those collection bags that are used when people are catheterized, um, they can't be used for taking samples because the, the urine sits in those for a long time and we can't get accurate microbial numbers from that because the microbes can grow um, in those bags. Okay, so here is a scary case study. Um, on, we have a microbiologist that is being taken to the emergency department. Um, and they have just general malaise, fever, um, and diffused myalgia, which is pain. Um, so they're thought to maybe, you know, I don't know. They don't know what they have. So they just give them a general oral antibiotic and send them home. Next day, she comes back, but this time tachycardiac. So high heart rate and hypotensive. Um, goes back to the hospital. Dies within three hours. Uh, they take a blood culture at this point and find it's positive for Neisseria meningitidis, serogroup C. Um, so what has this person been doing? Well, three days beforehand, um, she was preparing a gram stain from a blood culture of a patient. So she's a microbiologist, um, and they would later test that sample and find that sample had meningococcal disease, which is caused by Neisseria meningitidis. Um, and this microbiologist had handled the plates that uh, were containing this cerebrospinal fluid culture. Um, so the microbiologist is handling the samples from a patient that has meningitis. I think you can see where this is going. Uh, in this case, the coworkers report that their practice for aspirating or sucking up this fluid from the blood culture bottle was typically performed at just an open lab bench. So no biosafety cabinet, no filtration, no protection, no masks, none of this stuff. Um, so the CDC takes the sample from the dead person and the patient that was being processed and they identified that the strains of Neisseria meningitis are identical here, indicating that the microbiologist unknowingly infected themselves. Um, this problematic uh, lack of safety is because this lab did not normally process these kinds of samples. Um, it'd been four years since they'd done that. So this brings us back to something we've talked about previously, biosafety levels. Um, in the lab, uh, we work at a biosafety level one in our lab. Uh, biosafety level two is uh, generally for research and things like this. Um, you can use what we call biosafety cabinets, which are um, basically hoods that uh, filter the stuff so you work inside of a contained environment. Uh, biosafety level three is for things that can theoretically kill you. And four is the most dangerous things. That's full spacesuit airlock. There's only a few facilities in the country. So I've only ever worked at BSL two. Uh, BSL three is not something I have any interest in doing because those things uh, can really harm you. The problem is in a laboratory, we generally know what we're working with unless we're taking patient samples. Then we have to make some assumptions. If you're a clinical worker, you really don't know what's out there. So you kind of got to expect the worst. But in general, we tend to work as if we're working with BSL-2 because that's the most common stuff. So um, some protective clothing, if necessary, controlled access to rooms and um, using... Uh, biosafety cabinets for aerosols and things like that. But you never know what you're working with, so always be cautious is the rule here. Um, something like tuberculosis, right, is a BSL-3 because it can cause serious long-term infections and is easily transmitted through the air. Uh, COVID uh, samples are BSL-2. So how do you protect yourself? Well, I think most people are aware of this, hand washing, right? using gloves um, and face masks are critical, um, preventing spread through uh, respiratory uh, routes. If there are more serious things uh, suspected, um, 
then you might use other equipment, gowns for MRSA patients and things like this. Um, sterile collection devices um, have to be used, right? You have to make sure that what you're using to collect is starting sterile because oftentimes we're penetrating the body and this can, uh, you could theoretically introduce pathogens when you take blood or when you introduce a catheter or things like this. All right. Lots of material in there, uh, a lot about sample collection. I think that's the most important thing from this chapter. Um, we have sterile versus non-sterile sites. The non-sterile sites, we have to plate that stuff on selective media to make sure we get out uh, the normal microbiota and can find the pathogens in there. All right, that's it for 25.1.